So this morning we're in a series called A Rose in Harlem, because that's what TGH is. We are rose growing out of the concrete. And what we're talking about today is something that only God can bring about, much like a rose growing out of concrete. I believe that it is the most difficult and most dangerous of our core values as a church. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Acts, the sixth chapter, starting in verse 1, Acts chapter 6. It reads, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, what we're talking about today is both difficult and dangerous, but it has the power to actually transform the world. It has the power to bring justice, and it has the power to, to point people to you. Sometimes we think it's impossible. Remind us today that nothing is impossible with God. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. amen. You may be seated. So, I live in Inwood right now, but some of y'all may not know, I used to live around the corner, actually, on 127th Street, right here in Harlem. Now, this was like 11 years ago. I had just moved to the city a year earlier, and I wanted to be closer to work. I wanted to have a better commute, you know, and uh, between me and my two other white roommates, Harlem was what we could afford, right? And I know what you're thinking. Oh, my gentrifier, right? <laughs> well, let me just say that, yes, absolutely, 100%, I'm your poster child for a gentrifier because the apartment we moved into had been gut renovated. It was all brand new, and they were charging us quite a bit for it. Um, I, I don't know who lived there before. I don't know if they were pushed out by the landlord so that he could drastically raise the rent. I don't know if it was one family. I don't know if it was to families or whatever just trying to make it and they were pushed out. I didn't know, I didn't care to know. I just knew that we needed an apartment, we could pay for it, and we got it. And we only lived there for one year. So I imagine that the landlord, like, fine, he could have just raised the rent yet again the year after we left. Now, I may be like all woke about these issues now, but there was a time when I was absolutely complicit. And we need spaces, we need places where we can say, you know what, this issue is very complicated, and I see now how I was or am still complicit in it, but I want to be a part of bringing change. I'm thankful that TGH is that kind of place, or at least I hope it is. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. When Pastor Kenny started the gathering, he wanted it to be a place for the brownstone and the block, the gentrified and the gentrifier. But most churches are not that way. In fact, we really think it's impossible, like a rose growing out of the concrete. If we're honest, segregation is much just easier to deal with. Whether it's right or wrong or not, it's just easier to segregate ourselves by race, by class, by gender, by culture, whatever it might be. You know, recently I've been uh, binge-watching one of my favorite documentaries yet again for like the third or fourth time of Lost Count. It's the documentary of New York City by Rick Burns. Um, it's on YouTube. You can watch 
all 16 hours of New York history. Oh man, I'm a super nerd, but I love it. And um, it makes me cry every time, just hearing all these amazing stories of this amazing city, the highs and the lows. But as I'm watching this, I reflect on how New York City has this really mythical like view of itself, right? We see ourselves in so many ways as the capital of the entire world. We're so, uh, we're so diverse. We say that you know, uh, immigrants are our lifeblood. We have people from all over the world. You know, the Statue of Liberty is right there uh, at the, the beginning of the city. We say that we're all about diversity, but throughout the entire history of New York, immigrants were always looked down upon by native New Yorkers. I'll say mostly white European, English to be more specific, native New Yorkers. First it was the Jews. They, they welcomed them. Like that, was, that was pretty intense that they just welcomed them into the city. Well, they didn't really welcome, they just kind of allowed them to be there. They didn't turn them away. Then it was the Italians and the Germans that were despised. Then after them, a little bit later, after the Irish potato famine, it was all the Irish people that came. And they were Catholic too, so that was a whole, whole thing. They were what was wrong with this city. Then it was the Eastern Europeans later. And you could go all the way back to when the Dutch first settled in New Amsterdam, they, the, back to the native Lenape and Canarsie people that they saw as savages. Wow. But if you look at the history of New York, always, always on the bottom were blacks mm. who were systematically and purposely kept at the bottom rung of opportunity and society. They were given the poorest jobs and the poorest housing. New York City is truly a place of opportunity. It really is, compared to all the other places in the world, but it is much more complicated than that. You know, I just watched the part um, that talks about the 1930s in New York, and they talk about the ghettoization of black communities in this city and in every major city in the United States. Both the state and federal government worked with bank insurance, uh, yeah, banks, insurance companies, and real estate agencies to map neighborhoods and segregate them by race. If you don't know about redlining, educate yourself. Google it. I'm not going to tell you all about it. Figure it out. The segregation that we see in our city was not an accident. It was on purpose, built upon a system of white supremacy. And today, we're not just still dealing with redlining, right? Now we're dealing with gentrification on top of that. Gentrification forces communities of color to desegregate space that cities intentionally segregated to begin with. But it's not just public policy. It's also in the church. I'm going to look at Howard Thurman. Yep. We're looking at Howard Thurman this morning. This, I love this guy. He's a theologian. He wrote a book called Jesus and the Disinherited, and I highly, highly recommend it. And he talks about the evils of both segregation and how it plays out in the church. He writes this, It is necessary, therefore, for the privileged and the underprivileged to work on the common environment for the purpose of providing normal experiences of fellowship. That's that's, That's all he's saying. Segregation keeps us from having normal experiences of fellowship. This is one very important reason for the insistence that segregation is a complete ethical and moral evil. Whatever it may do for those who dwell on either side of the wall, one thing is certain, it poisons all normal contacts of those persons involved. The first step toward love is a common sharing of a sense of mutual worth and value. This cannot be discovered in a vacuum or in a series of artificial or hypothetical relationships. It must be in a real situation, natural and free. So what segregation does is it separates us from getting to know one another, from having a real relationship, not a fake relationship like we like to have. But look what he says about the church. He says, the experience of the common worship of God is such a moment. This should be a place where we're able to have common relationships. It is in this connection that American Christianity has betrayed the religion of Jesus almost beyond redemption. Churches have been established for the underprivileged, for the weak, for the poor, on the theory that they prefer to be among themselves. 
Churches have been established for the Chinese, the Japanese, the Korean, the Mexican, the Filipino, the Italian, and the Negro with the same theory in mind. The result is that in the one place in which normal free contacts might be the most naturally established, in which the relations of the individual to his God should take priority over conditions of class, race, power, status, wealth, or the like, this place is one of the chief instruments for guaranteeing barriers. As Martin Luther King Jr. said and many others, 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. We're talking about our third core value as a church. And this one is the hardest. It costs the most, and we do it the least. Now, we, if you've been here for the last two weeks, we've been talking about our core values, and we love, love our first two core values, right? Our first one is church for the unchurched. Let's go. Church for the unchurched? Yes, I love that. We get to speak in good vernacular. We get to communicate the gospel to the unsaved. Like, yes, come on. Our second core value, saving souls and bodies. Let's go. Come on. We're about justice here. We're going to save souls and bodies. Our third value, unity through dignity and diversity. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's good, you know, if it works for me. <laughs> so what is unity through dignity and diversity? One of the greatest gifts that God has given us is diversity. He's made us all with different skin colors, genders, languages, and cultures, and yet so often the world has only dignified the dominant culture, the dominant narrative. We believe in the beauty of the other, and we are a family that's committed to the work of dignifying that which is different. We want our church to look like heaven, and that's what we will build until Jesus returns. Yeah, clap it up. Yo, we haven't got, even got into it yet. Because here's my question. We can clap for it. How do we do that? How do we do that in a world with the history of injustice and prejudice? How could a, a small new church in the middle of Harlem ever hope to have unity through dignity and diversity in the midst of a history of segregation and now the reality of gentrification? Well, the early church gives us a model to follow. You see, in this passage this morning in Acts chapter 6, the young Jerusalem church, much like us, is about to experience expansion. And actually, it's going to expand way beyond just their city. It's going to affect the entire world. And in today's passage, they face a test, a test of prejudice and power, of segregation and injustice. And as a young church in Harlem, we are poised for a year of expansion, but we also must face a similar test. Listen to this. If we can embrace unity through dignity and diversity, there's no telling what God can do. But if we stick to our prejudices, our segregation, and injustice, it will short-circuit any expansion that God wants to do through us. Wow. And that leads me, to, leads me to my first point. Diversity demands truth-telling and truth-listening. I made up that second one. I don't, I've never heard it before. I, like I don't know. A lot of you are truth-tellers. You're going to drop some truth bombs, but truth-listening as well. Look at this in verse 1. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So here we have Jews, but we have Hebraic Jews and we have Hellenistic Jews. Hebraic Jews were the natives who spoke the language, who knew the lingo. It was their culture. They grew up there. They know how it works. The Hellenistic Jews were like transplants. They grew up outside of the city. They were in the Roman Empire somewhere. They didn't even speak Hebrew anymore, or Aramaic. They only spoke Greek, the language of the empire. And their culture was very much more like the empire. They were the outsiders, and they were the marginalized ones in this instance. Now, they've all come together in the, into the new family of Jesus, of course, but they have brought with them their, own their old attitudes and prejudices just like we bring our attitudes and prejudices into the church. And most likely, this problem that came up of, of uh, widows 
not receiving the food, this was just a symptom of a much bigger divide going on between these two groups. And it is often the case that divides are manifested through systemic injustice, isn't it? In the summer of 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri, the city exploded into months of demonstrations and protests after the killing of Michael Brown. Look, I know that it was predicated on the killing of Michael Brown, but it wasn't just about Michael Brown. As we now know, the police department had been oppressing the black residents of Ferguson for decades, gaining a reputation of being unjust. So when Michael Brown was killed, it was just the tipping point of a city that was already deeply divided. So here in this passage, we have an injustice against the Hellenistic widows. Make no mistake though, this is a great mercy ministry that the church is doing. They're doing great stuff. They are providing for some of the most marginalized people in the ancient world. Mm, but church, don't you know that in your justice ministry, there can still be injustice? We're out here thinking we can change the world. We're, we, we know the way, all right? We're going to tell everybody how to do it. We're going to bring justice. We forget how sinful and broken we are. We can bring injustice, even when we're trying to do work of justice. So when this was uncovered, what, what did the church do? Well, first, the Hellenistic Jews said something. They spoke up. They practiced truth-telling. The passage says that they complained. Now, this wasn't, they're, they're just not whining and complaining, all right? They're ready to do something about it. I think of a few things that Pastor Kenny has said. We put that slide up there. He says, don't come to me with a, with a problem without also bringing a solution, right? He's also said, if you recognize a problem, that's because God is calling you to be a part of the solution, right? right? That's a word for somebody right there. That's a word we've heard a few times. You need to get it into your head. <laughs> the Hellenistic Jews are not whining and complaining. They're bringing their complaint forward, truth-telling, and they're ready and willing to do something about it. So when the 12 apostles, the leaders of the church, heard about the truth-telling, they practiced truth-listening. Oh, this is so powerful. So many of us love, love to tell the truth. Come on, we're on Twitter dropping truth bombs on people. And then we out, bye. I'm not going to be a part of actually fixing the problem. I'm out of here. But the 12 practiced truth listening. They took it seriously. They truly listened. And how do I, how do I know they really listened? Well, if I think about if something like this happened in any church, any nonprofit, any business that you know, what are the things that are going to happen? I can think of at least four wrong responses to this. The first one would be like, they just brushed it under the rug. Oh, you got a complaint? Okay, well, that, we'll file that with the complaints. And uh, <laughs> back to business doesn't bother me. Back to business as usual. They just sweep it under the rug, right? What else would happen? There would be blaming. Blaming all over the place. Well, the real problem is this: these Hellenistic Jews, they're just, insert prejudice here. These Hellenistic Jews, are, they, they don't know the language. They're not, they don't know the lingo. They're lazy. They're dumb. You hear all these judgments that are just coming out? You see, here's the thing. When you start blaming someone, your racism and prejudice comes out. You see, what blaming is, is looking at some, something that someone else does different. But you don't just say it's different. You say it's bad. It's wrong. And the reason you do that is because you're insecure of yourself. So you have to build up a barrier. You have to say that they're not just different. They're wrong, which makes you right. They're bad, which makes you good. It's just another form of self salvation. So there could be they ignore it. Maybe they just blame people. Or we got to start an official investigation. Okay. We got to get the people together. It's going to take a few months, uh, probably put together by the people in power, you know, and we got to talk to all these people and file a report and probably nothing will ever get done and, and nothing will ever change. For the fourth thing I can think of is that there would be a paternalistic takeover. All right. The 12 apostles are like, y'all don't know how to run a food ministry. We walked with Jesus. So 
we're going to take over because y'all are dumb and don't know what you're doing. But none of that happened in this passage, right? We don't see any ignoring, sweeping under the rug. There's no blaming. There's no grand investigation. There's no paternalistic takeover. Instead, the 12 call everyone together, and they empower those who are being marginalized to take the lead in fixing it. When God called me in my life to embrace racial justice, which he did, he totally called me because I was lost in white world forever. He called me into a season of listening and learning, including cultural learning. Like I said, all I knew was white evangelical majority culture. So I changed the books that I read. I changed the podcasts that I listened to. I changed the TV shows and movies that I was watching. I went to grad school at a school where I knew I would be often the only white person in the room. I got a job at an after school program where I was the only white person there. I came under the leadership of a pastor of color in a church where sometimes I'm the only white person in the room. All of that was intentional, y'all. Because I, as a white man, I have the power and privilege to do none of those things. I don't have to be in places of, uh, of diversity in, at any time. But I chose to do it. If we are truly to be unified through dignity and diversity, it has to be a choice. Why, so why, do we, why don't we do it? There's a price. Diversity always includes conflict. Let me say it again. Diversity always includes conflict. You know how often it is? Always. Always. Let me see it. People in the back, always. How, how, how often is there, is there conflict? Always. Always, always guys. This is, this is part of the package. If we want to be a, div div excuse me, a diverse church, we have to get used to entering into uncomfortability. We got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Even if you look at the Bible, the early church, it happened right here. They're having these uh, racial segregation issues. And it wasn't an isolated incident. They didn't figure it out and then everything's fine. Now, if you read the rest of the book, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 15, chapter 19, you can look in Galatians chapter 2, and then. The rest of the New Testament is a whole lot of figuring out what do we do with these different cultures that God has brought together. That's like the rest of the New Testament. That's good. Listen to this. We know that the gathering is close to the ideal of being unified when everyone in the church feels considered and uncomfortable at the same time. You feel considered, mm, but also uncomfortable yeah. at the same time. Ooh, that's a, that's, ooh. That's hard, y'all. That's hard. That's why we don't do it. Because it, the, it costs us so much. You see, seeking diversity always leads us into seasons where we will be uncomfortable. Someone, someone's cultural expression will not be represented. Someone will feel left out. Someone will feel marginalized. But we must, must talk about it. Without jumping to conclusions, blaming, investigating, or taking over, we need both truth telling and truth listening. If we have those two together, it's powerful. That leads me to my second point. Dignity demands giving away power. Dignity demands giving away power. Look at verse 2. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, we will turn this responsibility over to them. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, sorry Pumba, he didn't make he didn't make it, just Timon, <laughs> Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch. Huh? Yeah. I had to throw that one in there. Come on. Timon is in the Bible. Anyway. <laughs> And Antioch, uh, he was a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the 12 bring everyone together and give the people a standard for who the leader should be to fix this. Now, first, let me just address that they chose seven men to do this. 
Now, this is probably following a traditional Jewish custom of having a council of seven men that would lead in, in a town. Y'all, the church is not perfect. Even the early church. You know, maybe they needed someone to do some truth-telling back in the first century as well. So, regardless of that, the standard that they give for these men is that they first must have a good reputation. The text actually says that they must be known, a.k.a. they have a good rep. Okay, they got references you can look up. Two, they have to be full of the Spirit. All Christians are given the Holy Spirit when we, when we, uh, when we follow Christ, but the Bible also talks about being filled or full of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 gives us the results of the Spirit's work in somebody's life. So these, these seven men had to be just overflowing with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. They had to be the kind of people that were walking in step with the Spirit. Then when the Spirit said jump, they said how high. Stephen, the first guy on the list, he was actually known to do miracles. So third, they have to be full of wisdom. And in other words, they, they just need to have the practical skills to lead this kind of mercy ministry. But did you notice what was not on the list? They have to be Hellenistic Jews. That was not on the list, y'all. But lo and behold, all seven of those names are Greek Hellenistic names. Y'all missed that. They are all Greek names. That means that they are giving the marginalized people all the power. All the power. Those who are marginalized would say, you're the leaders now. Listen, I, I saw some uh, commentator, commentator, he was like, this is the first uh, example of affirmative action in the Bible. I'm like, affirmative action would have been like one or two maybe. Yeah. All seven. Yes. All seven. Yes. And you know what this means? They're putting themselves in a vulnerable place. Because yeah. they could take revenge. Yeah. This is totally based on trust yes. and love towards one another. And the apostles publicly, publicly get these men up there. They place their hands on them. They consecrate them in front of the people and declare to everyone, they're the ones in charge now, not us. I mean, this is amazing, right? Where would we ever see this happen in our world today? Look, giving away power like this is so important to dignity, to dignify those that the world has thrown away. Look, as many of you know, I am preparing to start my own church, to plant a church in the Fordham area of the Bronx. I feel the love. <laughs> I said it, gotta do it. There you go, God said it, so I gotta go. So as a white man, don't know if you noticed, but as a white man, I could do what a lot of church plants have done in the city historically. I could get a whole bunch of uh, non-Bronx people, probably a lot of them white, and we could just, I could convince them all to move to the Bronx, and poof, now we got a church with like 40 people in it right away. I could do that. I could do that. I'm not going to do that. That would be insanely stupid, and probably predicate gentrification. I mean, that kind of works downtown, but it wouldn't work in the boogie down, right? Come on. It wasn't. It was not work. I, I had to, y'all. I had to. So instead, instead, I'm coming with a different attitude, y'all. I know that, here's the thing, I'm not starting a church in the Bronx. God is starting a church in the Bronx. And God has given me a vision to consecrate staff members, team members, leaders, volunteers who are Bronx natives. That means I am constantly going to have to give power away. How am I able to do this? Because I have received power. Look, I, I, me, am preaching at Pastor Kenny's church. All right? He has given power to me. You know who did this all the time? Jesus. Yes, that's all right. Somebody said it down here. You went to Sunday school. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus did this all the time. He elevated the least and the last. He said, the last, oh, they're actually going to be first. He said that the greatest among you will be the servant. 
He said that we should be like little children. They don't have any authority. They don't have any knowledge. Like little children. That's what he wants us to be like. And let me tell you this morning. You feel like you're, you're nothing, that Jesus can't use you? Jesus can use you. All right? He doesn't care about your ethnicity, your skin color, your education level, what your family is like, your addiction, your shame, your Bible knowledge, your resume. Listen to this. If you're placing yourself on the bottom of any list, you're at the top of Jesus' list every time. I don't care how many great things you've done, how many great things you haven't done. You are at the top of Jesus' list. He has given you his spirit. He has called you to do more than you could possibly ask or imagine. You see, the 12 apostles themselves, these 12 leaders of the church, who were they? They were nobodies before they met Jesus. They were day laborers, fishermen that society had thrown away. Jesus gave them nobodies, his power and authority. So these guys, they know they have received power, so they're practicing giving power to others, which leads me to my third point. Unity demands a clear mission. Unity demands a clear mission. Look at verse 2. What did those 12 apostles do? They said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. We will return this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. You see, the food program for these widows it was important. It needed to happen. But the apostles were not getting distracted from what God had actually called them to do. You see, the 12, these are the 12 that followed Jesus when he was in his earthly ministry on earth. They saw him do miracles. They saw him open the eyes of the blind, heal the lame, and raise the dead. They heard all of his teachings. And they were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Yeah, some of y'all don't know that there were eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection, all right? This wasn't just a fairy tale or a story that was passed down. When, uh, when the uh, New Testament authors wrote these texts that said there's uh, eyewitness people, you could go talk to them. They're still alive. You could go ask, hey, did this really happen? Did you really see Jesus? Yes, absolutely, and it changed my life. There were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. That's who these people were. And there calling was that they were uniquely equipped to preach the good news of Jesus and to proclaim the word of God. You see, Jesus did not come so that they could start a food program feeding widows in Jerusalem. Was it needed? Yeah. But that was not their mission. Look, TGH, we're not a nonprofit. This is not a community organization. We're not a food pantry, advocacy group, housing coalition, after school program, job training center, senior center, mental health center, or any other kind of center you can come up with. We might help start all of those things, and I hope we do. But first and foremost, we are the church of Jesus Christ. I hope we start all those things. But we got to be clear on what our mission is. TGH, do you know what our mission is? Let's put it up there. Building bridges that lead to reconciliation. Vertical reconciliation with God and a horizontal re reconciliation with one another. That means that we seek for the kingdom of God to be fully present in Harlem as it is in heaven. Where Jesus brings resurrection to broken lives and where all people enjoy the shalom of God. That's what we're here to do. And you know what happens after the church in Jerusalem here, after they are unified through dignity and diversity? Expansion. Expansion, y'all. It's huge. Look at verse 7. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a, number, a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So the word of God spread, and not only did the church grow, but it grew rapidly, including priests from the Jewish temple. That, that I could, that's amazing in, in and of itself. But more than that, 
it bridged the way to greater expansion throughout the world because unity is a bridge to expansion. Unity is the bridge to expansion. If you look at the list of those seven men that were chosen, the first of them is Stephen. He became a powerful defender of the faith, miracle worker, and the first martyr in the church. And his death sparked a persecution against the church that caused it to explode and leave Jerusalem and spread all over the world. And guess who were the first Christians to share the good news of Jesus to Hellenistic Gentiles? That's right. It was our Hellenistic Jews. They already knew the culture, the language, everything. They were able to bridge that divide. And you should be thankful for that because most of y'all listen to my voice are not Jews. Yeah. You Gentiles. <laughs> Another one of the seven, Philip. He became an amazing evangelist that bridged ethnic divides. He shared the good news of Jesus with Samaritans that were half Jewish. Then the spirit plucked him, put him over here, and he shared the gospel with an Ethiopian royal official, birthing one of the oldest expressions of the Christian faith in the world to this day. You can go to Ethiopia, to the Ethiopian Christian church in Africa. Shout out to Africa out here. <laughs> y'all, this is ex y'all, TGH is going to Africa. The impact that we have here is going to spread to the world. It is not just going to be New York City. BK's been talking about this from the beginning. He said we're not just starting a church, we're starting a movement. Look. But here's the thing, y'all. I, got, I, got I gotta go back to truth telling. Back to the truth. Uh oh, yeah. Unity is hard. It is hard. It is continual hard work. We can be truth tellers and truth listeners. We can actually practice giving away power. We can stay focused on our mission and still not be unified. You see, the issues of racism, prejudice, segregation, they go much deeper than we dare know. There is a deeper issue at work in our lives. The Bible calls it sin. Each of us has chosen to look at someone else and condemn them in order to justify ourselves. It's just in us. But y'all, God is not like us. I am so glad God is not like us. You see, God is the perfect unity of dignity and diversity. The God of the Bible is a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, always deferring to the other, always showing love to the other, always working together. You see, Jesus is God in the flesh. You see, Jesus was the perfect truth teller and truth listener. He came full of both grace and truth. He, can, he will destroy you with truth bombs, but he loves you unconditionally. Jesus constantly gave power away. He chose his 12 apostles from those that society had thrown away. He pours out the spirit on us broken people, and he calls us to be his messengers to the world of his good news. Jesus was laser focused on his ultimate mission of restoring a segregated world. Jesus did not come to do miracles, to give good teaching and be a nice person. He came to die for the sins of the world so that you and I could be restored in our relationship with God and with one another. It is the only way through Jesus that we can experience unity through dignity and diversity. So as I prepare to wrap up here, I want you to just imagine what a church of unity through dignity and diversity would look like. Just imagine with me a church where the marginalized are dignified, where they are listened to rather than ignored, blamed, or thrown away. Imagine a church that gives power to the marginalized that recognizes and empowers those that society has thrown away. Imagine a church that is laser focused on what Harlem would look like, not if TGH was big, not if we had more ministries, not if everyone knew our name, but if Harlem looked more like heaven. 
in this year of expansion. That is what unity through dignity and diversity is all about. Join me in prayer. Father God, we can only imagine what you're going to do through the Gathering Harlem. Expansion means more than we can even imagine. But it won't happen unless you make us unified. Unify us, God. Do the impossible in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.